Hi everyone, can you hear us? So maybe we will wait five minutes for some more people to, to join and then we can get started. Thanks for, for coming. Okay, we can start in two minutes. So, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the first Agila meetup. So the idea is that we will do this meetup every two weeks and we will either do demos or talk with you about features, do Q&A sessions and these kind of things. And the idea is that every time at least some people from our team, from the Agile side are going to join and that we will also try to record these meetings for yeah, people that cannot attend. So if anyone is feeling uncomfortable with that, feel free to, to let us know or to disable the camera or audio or these kind of things as well. Also, we wanted to have this recurrent meeting, so also sending invites to your emails. And that's also why we had the marketing consent turned on. So if anyone has decided not to do the marketing consent due to other marketing sales reasons, feel free to reach out and, and just send in a Slack that you want to get this email about, about yeah, bi-weekly meetup for Agila. And this week, we will start with a brief demo of Danny that he's been working on using text descriptives for uh, metadata and filtering, which will we uh, have just released in Agila 1.18. And for um, after that, we'll have some room for open Q&A and you can ask questions about Agila features or things regarding to NLP. And we will yeah, try to answer these things uh, as, uh, as the best of, of our uh, knowledge. Thanks, David. And thanks everyone for, for attending. It's uh, really nice to see a lot of uh, known names. Uh, yeah, really excited. Yeah, the idea is in these community meetups to do a brief demo of how to actually get started with Argila uh, and also to show some of our new features. So it's a good way for people that didn't uh, try Argila yet to, to see how they can get started, but also for people already using Argila to see some of the latest features and how we think about them and most importantly to give feedback so the q a session is like the core of the whole thing but uh, i would like to start yeah preparing the discussion with with a brief demo so i will go to this call up so essentially what we will do is to install the libraries that we need for this use case as david mentioned we want to show how to use the new, the new metadata filters and sorting features for the feedback task and to do that we are going to use a library that we highly recommend which is called text descriptives uh, it's been on top of spacey and essentially what they provide is a way to extract the useful statistics of text there are like i would say like even too many so we will see just some of them and we will see how to actually leverage them with argila to actually quickly inspect a data set to clean it, to label it, and to understand. So yeah, first of all, we need to, I'm using Colab and we will share this Colab that should be fully reproducible. And first thing we need to do is to use pip to install Argila, to install the Hugging Face datasets, to read an example dataset. Ideally, you could use at the end your own datasets. Uh, so you could use pandas or even data sets to read uh, CSV or databases uh, with your own data. But for this example, we are going to use a highly, uh, a very well-known data set. Um, and then we need to install text descriptives. And yeah, essentially that line, that's what it does. So I know some of you are using already like your own self-hosted version of Argila, but for those that didn't yet try the tool, the easiest way is to use the hub with the new not new anymore, but with this integration that we have that essentially allows you to deploy a quick start version of Argila. And this quick start version is really the full open source product, uh, but we call it quick start because it's reduced in, in terms of performance because it's everything on the same, on the same container essentially. So we have Elasticsearch, the database and the server on the same container. So it's actually useful to get started and for really a uh, small scale project. So what I do here is just to put in a name. So this is the space name. Then to find Argila, you need to go to the Docker version. And then you will see that there are some configurations here. So this one 
you really don't need to do anything about because it's about using GPUs, but Argila is more a data, a data management tool. So we really don't do any inference or any training. So you are not going to need GPUs for running Argila. Uh, the most relevant one is persistent storage, which means that if you select this option, you will need to pay uh, per hour. But this will guarantee that if the Docker image, the, the Docker container gets restarted, which happens uh, frequently or you don't use it, you will lose your, your data. So this persistent storage is really if you are going to do some labeling for some time and you don't want to, to lose your data. But if you just want to just run a, one of the tutorials we have or just do some testing, you can uh, feel free to use the kind of ephemeral uh, persistent storage, which, mean, which means that your data will be there uh, in this instance for, I don't know, 24 hours, 48 hours, it depends. Then you have the space secrets, which is essentially a way to uh, configure some of the credentials. So the usernames, the API keys, and so on. I will explain what all those mean, but essentially those are roles in Argila. And then for those roles, you can set up different things like the username, the API key, or the password. But we will leave it as it is. Uh, and in this way, I will show you the kind of the default credentials for this quick start. Uh, and this will help you to read the docs and actually run the tutorials that we have with this, with this default credential. So after setting this up, okay, I already created this one. So let's another name. So after doing this, I forgot to say that you need an account on Hugging Face. So yeah, in order to launch this, you need to have an account either of, of yourself or an organization. I'm running this on my personal profile. And this will take around five minutes to actually launch the instance. And once the instance is the set up, you will see a screen like this, and then you will need to use the default credentials. But if you change the username and the password, you will use the ones that you set it up. Uh, for this default instance, admin is an admin user, and then the password is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can find this in the docs in the quick start section. So essentially now I can log in and this is, as you can see, embedded into the hub. There's an important option here, which is embed this space. And we recommend to go here and go to the direct URL because you will get not an iframe of, of the tool, but essentially this, the access to the full web application. Uh, I want to leave some place for questions so far. Okay, if there are no questions, I will continue. <clears throat> so once we've done that, we already have the API URL, which is the one that we just showed. So if we go here, this is the API URL. So it's the access to the web application, but also the base URL for the API. We just need to add that as the API URL and then the API key. If you don't change it, it will be admin.api key. And the init method is essentially to connect the client with the server. So after doing this, all the operations that we will do with the RG will be actually sending data to, to, to the server we just connected. So the goal of this example is essentially to prepare a data set. In this case, it is an instruction following or instruction data set that is very well known. It's a bit old and old in the LLM space means one year, but one year ago it was something. Now I don't think like a lot of people uses it. Uh, and essentially it's a data set that has been generated synthetically with, with GPT, I think it was GPT-3, I don't know, I don't remember, but essentially it's a, a synthetic data set with instructions and with responses with the goal of distilling the knowledge and the abilities of uh, larger models into open source models. So this was one of the first works to actually use this kind of distillation through synthetic data. So this data set is called Alpaca and we will read it uh, with, uh, with the load data set from Hugging Face data sets. We will select 10,000 examples. Uh, the full data set is 50K. But essentially for this uh, example, I just read like the first, uh, not the first because I shuffled the data set, but I, I read 10,000 10, rows. 
Then in the other part, what we will do is to use the text descriptives uh, library and we will compute some statistics. We will see what I mean by that about the instruction. So the instruction is, if we see here, is an instruction is like this. So create a social media post to promote the blah, blah, blah. And then an output, this is the response of the LLM. Uh, and the input is what is called context in other places and it's part of the instruction. So you give an instruction and you also give, imagine like a copy pasted, I don't know, web, web content and you ask the LLM to actually summarize or to extract some information. So those are the three fields, main fields on Alpaca. And what we do here is essentially uh, take the instructions, use a spacey pipeline under the hood uh, for the English language. And then we ask test descriptives to compute statistics about readability we will see some of them quality and information theory you have a lot of different categories of metrics you can extract but i just selected a few of them to show you how to actually use these statistics uh, within argila and the metadata filters to actually understand very quickly the the quality and, and the potential issues of of an alpaca data set. so we do the same for the output essentially what we do is to generate two data frames with these metrics. This is a util method that I created to transform the types of pandas, which are NumPy, NumPy data types into pure Python types. And this is needed to actually clean up the types before sending data to Argila. We do plan to provide these utils within the library. So you don't need to write your own cleanup if you are using pandas, but essentially this, this function, what it does is to transform the data types into something that is pure Python. So Argila won't complain when you send the data. So if we see like the first two columns of the instruction data frame that we have a ton of different statistics, some of them are related to how long is the text, uh, how many sentences, uh, and others are related to readability. So essentially some uh, metrics uh, that have been developed in the past years to actually try to take a text and uh, give a score of how easy or difficult to read this. For example, for code uh, instructions and code outputs, probably the readability index of this kind of like more traditional metrics will not be so useful, but as we will see, it will be useful just to find this type of uh, examples. So what I do is to essentially take some of them. So because I didn't want to overload the metadata filters, I took uh, some related to the length of the text, uh, a quality check. That is something that uh, text descriptives does by combining different metrics. And essentially it will tell you if, uh, if the text is like uh, high quality or not. We will see that this is not always the, the case and it's not always useful, but it can be an indicator of, of, of the quality of the text. Essentially, I show here the values that we have for those. And this is probably the most interesting part and is how to set up a data set with a new feedback data set with some fields and some questions and how to actually integrate these statistics that we've gathered. But before I wanted to show you the data set, so you, we don't look at code all the time. So the result of creating the data set is what we see in the screen. As I said, yeah, we have instructions, inputs and outputs. And then what I did is to create a question, probably not very useful, but this is something we did one year ago with the Alpaca data sets and Alpaca translations to actually clean up because as this data is synthetic, there were many issues with the quality. For example, we had models or some of the outputs and instructions were completely hallucinations or completely like out of, out, out of context. So actually what we did with the community is to clean up those data sets and try to come up with uh, strategies to clean them up. So yeah, this question is related to the quality or the helpfulness or correctness of this, of this uh, record. Um, this is a label question as we will see later. Uh, and this is a text question. This is something that wasn't available for text classification previously in Argila, but now it is. Now you can combine label questions for text classification with, with uh, text free text fields. So in this case, if I say no, I can actually explain why I think this is not high quality or a correct example. Are there questions so far? Okay, so let's continue. So I will explain now how 
we got to this data set. So in Argila feedback, you need to define fields. So what we saw here, and in this case, I'm going to say, okay, I have an instruction field, an input field, which is not always available. Uh, so in instruction tuning or instruction data sets, sometimes you have an input or a context. For example, if it's about summarizing text or if it's about uh, extracting information, but in some other cases, you actually don't have uh, an input or a context. So that's why we say Argila to sometimes don't expect this, this input. This is another interesting feature that we might show in further online meetups and is the ability of using Markdown, which actually includes the ability of using HTML. Uh, and we will be showing in the coming days examples on how to actually leverage this because we think it's very powerful to show images, to show links, to show tables and everything that you can imagine to actually provide a rich content in, this, in these fields. So the other thing you need to configure are the questions. The questions are really the different aspects of feedback you want to gather from users. And if you are doing predictive NLP, it can be just a label question. If you want to train a text classifier, it can be a multi, multi-label multi question. And then it can be a combination of other questions like the free form, a free text question that we've seen before, or ranking questions if you are doing uh, preference tuning. Actually, it's very flexible and you can define the, the questions and set them up as you see fit. If you are doing predictive NLP, maybe you just need these two questions, but if you are doing something more complex and you want to have more feedback from your users, you can combine those with, uh, with other questions. So how it looks in the UI is like this. So let me close this one and go directly to this one. So in the UI, the questions are shown here and it can be, they can be edited here. So we provide some yeah, some configurations for this. So imagine you make a you misspell some of the the titles, or you want to change the input to accept the, or use markdown. You can do it here, and the same for the questions. And we think like the questions is highly important because as you go and get started with labeling or a feedback collection project, you might uh, get you might receive comments from your labelers saying, okay, this question is not so clear. Could you please clarify so you can change the title, which is what we show on top of the question. And you can also provide more context in the description. So for example, if we start adding this, that we will be adding what's this name. Sorry? Yeah, a pop-up or a, yeah, yeah, a pop-up. So essentially here you can explain your users, provide more context about how to actually label. The other important part is the uh, notation guidelines. They accept markdown, so you can provide very well-defined uh, guidelines and the users, they can actually see them when they are annotating to check if they are actually understanding the task. So if we move forward, we have the metadata properties. So this is new from, I think it was yesterday's release, 0.18, and it's a way to define metadata properties. For those of you already using metadata for the other type of data sets, it is very similar, but also we try to improve the user experience and also like the efficiency of using this. So in this case, we introduce data types for metadata properties, and we will see in a sec why we did this and why it's useful. So essentially what I do here is to create different metadata properties of different types, integers, terms, which is a list of strings and floats. And I create one of them for each for each field. I'm not using the input field, but I'm interested in the instruction field and the output field. And essentially I will add the each of these statistics for the instruction and each of these of statistics for the output. So once we do this, and by the way, uh, in the previous release, we introduced uh, task templates, because as you can see, this can get hard to configure. So for text classification, for different use cases related to text generation or LLMs, you can actually use task templates, which uh, are much more easy to, to configure because you just need to say, okay, I want a feedback data set for text classification and you don't need to set up everything. You, if you want, you can further customize it, but uh, you don't need to write down all this code. So in the next line, what I do is to instantiate my data sets with the fields, questions, and metadata properties. 
And then in this part, I start adding records. So I create a list of feedback records with the instruction coming from the uh, Hugging Face data set and also from the metadata, which uses the data frames that I created, the instruction and the output one. And I create essentially, this is a dictionary indexed by, the, by these keys. So after doing that, there are two ways to actually arrive to this. So the first one is actually start adding records to your local data set. So at this point, you haven't added anything to the server, but you can start adding records and this will add the records to your local instance of uh, the data set. And then you can actually push this data to Argila together with the records. The other way to do it, and this is something that we introduced not, not so long ago, is this idea of remote data set. So once you push a data set to Arquila, you will get an, a new object that is a remote data set. Every operation that you do, like adding records, it will be synchronized with the server. So in this case, what I do is to essentially create an empty data set in Arquila that is called Alpaca Community and in this workspace, uh, and that will give me this data set, but without records and using the remote data set object, I will add records. So when I do this operation, the records will be sent to the, will be sent to the server. And I wanted to just show you how to use the new metadata properties that we have created. And with that, I think we can go for Q and A and, and discussions. So after adding uh, these records, what I have is 10, 10,000 records and I added uh, different properties for each of them. So for example, the, the number of characters in the instruction, this is new. So the old, the previous data sets in Arquila, they didn't have this visualization or for integers and floats. And we think it's pretty, pretty handy to actually have a slider. So in this case, I'm filtering those instructions that are short and I can also do the opposite. So for example, I will just one record that is really long as compared to the others. You can have also the same for float. So for real numbers, this is the entropy. And you can also have terms. So in this case, the one that we mentioned, like does the output pass the quality check of the text descriptive? So if we go to false, we might see some things. So I, as you can see, why not why this is not passing the quality check we don't know maybe we could look at the metrics but essentially this is computed by the text descriptive descriptive library so essentially this is the metadata filter but probably for this type of metrics what is more interesting is for example to uh, sort for example let's look at the most difficult to to read outputs so in this small data set is this one and this one, so really long outputs. And if we do the opposite, probably we will find that the outputs are really simple. So this is really easy to, to read. And you see how short they are. Another thing we can do is to actually use the number of characters of the instruction and see very short instructions. And as you will see, most of them are related to, to mathematics. So the idea is that with these filters, you can quickly zoom in into the data set uh, and actually clean it up or label uh, what you want. Uh, and yeah, I wanted to, to show you this, this new feature and I think I didn't forget anything. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Danny. And I saw there were some questions already coming in. So feel free to, there's this Q&A box, feel free to provide some questions. In the meantime, I also added this like form for Google Forms and you can uh, actually provide some feedback and actually request for the following meetup if you want. Danny, so the first question that came in was a question uh, about from Yese Avesia uh, about the differences between owners, admins and annotators. Very good question. So the, the difference between owners and admins is that the owner is like the super user and it can actually do everything with the settings. So it can create users, it can create workspaces, it can create data sets, so everything. The admin uh, has similar rights, but they are limited to the workspaces. 
uh, that, that this admin has been assigned to. For example, an owner can say, okay, I want an admin for this project because uh, this will be the person actually handling the data sets and, the, and yeah, doing the configurations and so on. The difference between owner and admin is a way to actually have kind of admins per workspace. Uh, and the admins and the owners can actually yeah, do mostly everything. They can, they can configure the data sets as we saw in the settings, and they can actually use the Python SDK to upload data, update data, read data, and so on. And the annotators, uh, the idea is that they have limited rights to, to change the settings, and they have, of course, limited rights to create data sets and, do, and add data to, to, the, to them. So I think recently we added a table to explain this. I don't know if that was included already or not. So maybe I can show you in the docs. I think it should be under user management. Yeah, so we added this uh, small table uh, where we summarize the different rights that you can have for, for users. Yeah. Did that answer the question? The uh, next question uh, was if you could share the notebook or the URL to, to the collab. I will. Perfect. Then there was a question about uh, showing how to apply weak labeling rules programmatically to the Python SDK. But this one I already answered. And I think for follow-up meet meetings, uh, if, if people actually want to discuss specific topics, uh, feel free to reach out and we can actually prepare for these kind of things and ensure there's a comprehensible notebook. And uh, feedback is always welcome. Then a question from Moritz. What are going to be the main new features and priorities for Agila that we are working on? So I think one of the main things that, that we are actually working on is that we are had all of these cool features from the old data sets, so the data sets for text classification, token classification, and text to text, like semantic search, like the metadata filters that we've just uh, added to the feedback data set. And we yeah, aim to align, aim to strive for feature parity, so to say, where all of these old features that were familiar and working really well in the old data sets actually get ported to the new feedback data set so that we use that as a new baseline for, for Argilla and also work towards Argilla 2.0 in that sense. Is that clear, Moritz? And on top of that, Danny also opened the Argilla roadmap where you can have a look at all of these specific things that we will work on and you can actually contribute and give feedback there as well. And we will try to take to the, that into account into the scoping when we're working on those. Then Argela is a really cool tool and everything is free. And uh, how are we planning to monetize that in the medium term? And do we have a roadmap for that? Uh, I think I'm going to pass this one to, to Danny. Cool. So the, the question is, how do, you plan, how do we plan to monetize? Yeah, so we have actually a commercial product that is called Argila Cloud. And right now it's a SaaS version of the open source, so no extra features. Okay. Actually, we have already paying customers and we have the pricing, at least the different subscription plans available in the website. Maybe I can show you, but the plan is essentially to provide a cloud version of the product that is actually following this open core model where we make the core open source and very useful for everyone. And then we start adding enterprise features for really large teams or, or people that actually need extra features that are not useful for, for normal practitioners or even small businesses. So the model will be a SaaS plus deployment. Yeah, and it's good to add that we plan to yeah, keep the, the default version of Agile free in the, for forever. And the, yeah, the features that will be added, to, those are specific, uh, specifically related to the cloud. Then where does the name Argela come from? So yeah, the, the name comes from uh, clay in Latin, Italian, and even in, in Catalan. And this, uh, this idea of clay came from that we think like data is, is a way to give shape to, to, to models. So we really like this idea of something that is uh, related to arts, to humans, and to actually building tools because yeah, clay has been one of the most ancient ways of actually building tools for humans. 
So the advantage of paid argilla over tools like the snorkel flow. So that there are many differences in terms of features and the product. I think we, we focus on different use cases. For us, it's always been more about this fusion between AI teams, data teams, and humans in the loop. While we have, we have some programmatic features that hasn't been like, like the main core value of Argila. The main core value of Argila, it's been really involving human experts in the process of building tools. And another difference is that we've been focusing with extreme focus on integration with uh, other tools in the community and extreme focus on MLOps and NLP. Uh, and that means that uh, it's really easy to get going if you are using Spacey, Hugging Face and others. So I would say like a snorkel flow is a larger platform that you really need to justify to actually deploy like a company wide, while Argila is more like an MLOps component you can get started with. And what we see in many of our users and customers is that you can get started with some use cases and then you can actually scale that up. While I think other uh, more end-to-end -end platforms uh, really about an integration of this platform into the full uh, process before even getting started with, uh, with it. But yeah, that's my, my main explanation for that. Yeah, that's a very good question. So we don't have any certification so far, but we will be starting to look at them next quarter. So Q1 next year in order to have some data security and data privacy certifications to ensure that data is, is kept pri private. But we know that for certain institutions and organizations, that's not enough. As I said, we have one version of Argila Cloud that can be actually deployed on, on virtual private clouds. So actually the data will not leave the, the perimeter, the cloud perimeter of, of the user and the customer. So does anyone have any follow-up questions? Otherwise I also have a brief presentation about making the most of markdown. So if nobody has anything else, perfect. Okay, so what I have been uh, working on lately, or what we've been seeing with the like the new feedback data set, is that yeah, besides and also with LLMs, is that besides all of these cool basic text things that all of us love, we are also seeing a lot of these more HTML and, and uh, HTML rich content that's being fed into to LLMs and to NLP processes. And one of the things that yeah, we can actually do with the feedback data set and with the fields from the feedback data set is actually include all of these HTML content in our markdown within the text fields of, of Agila. And that's cool. And I tried to start to play around with that and actually came up with this notebook to show you how to exploit Displacy for like dependency visualization and ER visualization, and also like Spencat visualization, which is included in the Displacy library. How you can actually add images, video, and audio to Argela. Small note, it's a, a kind of limited because we do add it directly within the browser, but for really basic text and token classification, text and video and audio classification use cases, or just to add some additional context to your processes. It's quite useful. And to actually extract tables and fig figures and these kind of things and add them uh, to your feedback data as well. So what we will actually be doing is we will, we will be installing some libraries, Argela 1.17 still data sets. And on top of that, also in Structured, which is a, a library that we can actually use in combination with like unstructured data that we can later on add to, to like process PDFs, process JSON files, process XML, and all of these like huge data sources that, that are familiar to the finance, finance uh, field and also the banking field. And on top of that, we'll be adding Spacey and Spacey transformers, pillow, span marker, and some sound and, and files to be able to load sound files. And we will be downloading a basic spacey model, just a small one, because it's a demo. So we install this. Then what we will do is actually initialize Argilla, similar to what, what Danny did before. And we'll be importing all of the things that we need later on in the process. Then after that, we will get yeah, into the coding. So this place is actually a library from Spacey that under the hood is actually using a lot of formatted HTML to enable, in order to be able to visualize things like NER. 
And instead of the basic SPACE C NER model, I will be using one of uh, Tom Eisen's uh, spam marker models, which is a, a really cool library that actually speeds up and training for NER models and it also ensures yeah, state-of-the-art results on a lot of these NER benchmarks. And you can actually yeah, look at the documentation and I'll be using a Funer fine-tuned model, which I which is a data set that I really love. And the Funer data set is actually have more fine-grained representation of the more common NER things where, for example, a person is not only classified as a person, but as a yeah, subcategory of the person like actor, artist, author, and these kind of things. So we can actually initialize the pipeline. Then after that, a cool thing that you can do with this place is uh, render this uh, visualization as uh, a dependency of, in, of text uh, within a sentence, of tokens within a sentence. Uh, what you can also do is when you load this model and then do this place you render, actually visualize the text as an overview of the entities in the text. And the nice thing is that this is all HTML and it can actually be added to the feedback data set. So what happens is that we always need to think about how to configure our feedback data set. And in this case, we will be yeah, wanting to visualize the text, the dependency visualization, the entities, and for all of these text fields, we'll be using a markdown uh, enabled text field. And for example, for the questions, what we could do is uh, add a label question, a multi-label question, and some uh, text questions for potential dependency and NER correction. For now, we will be doing that with Markdown enabled. And with Markdown enabled, we'll be not really directly passing a token classification question, so to say, but we'll be just be passing a Markdown table representation of the spans that we've annotated as a kind of a shortcut up until that we've added the token classification feature to the feedback data set. So we can actually create this data set. And what happens is that we, when we push it to our Jilla, we actually get a remote feedback data set back with ID, some data set information, a URL. And the thing about the remote feedback data set is that it's directly linked to the, the database and to the Jilla server. So all of the changes that we make directly get represented in the, in the server as well. Then as a example, what we'll be doing is actually load the Funer data set, uh, which is the same data set that's been used to train the model that we've loaded and added to the Spacey pipeline. Next, what we do is actually wrap some of this HTML into a max width component to ensure that it doesn't get too wide and we can actually scroll in there. On top of that, we will be creating some token, some text out of the individual tokens in the data set, and we'll be processing each one of these texts as uh, spacey documents. Then when we'll be looping door through each one of these documents and actually creating these feedback records. Within the records, what we'll do is we'll add the text as default string. We'll be rendering the dependency as HTML and we'll be rendering the entities obtained from the spacey doc as HTML as well. And we've set Jupyter to false uh, to ensure that we actually get an HTML string back and not uh, render the visualization in Jupyter as, as shown above. And on top of that, we will be adding these, uh, these answer suggestions that we provide as initial suggestions within our UI to showcase like these tables about uh, the dependency classification and the NER classification. And the nice thing is that when adding records, there's something going wrong. Let's see, maybe I can use the for API. So maybe if there are any questions in the meantime, then maybe Danny can Answer those while I'm fixing the. You should do your best. Okay, I fixed it. And I will share my screen again. So the what I did just to showcase is yeah, initialize to our running deployment, and then actually set the workspace to recognize and create the feedback data set again load the Funerge dataset, and then push the records to Agila. So the nice thing that we can see here 
is yeah, we, that we actually end up with this data set where you, we have the text, the dependencies, and the entities actually visualized within our GLF feedback data set. And what we also see here is that there's this uh, suggestion highlight where we can later on correct for the text and also uh, correct for like the NER thing. So for example, if this wouldn't have been Paul, but just uh, Paul International Airport, but instead just Paul, you can actually add like some feedback here already for NER classification. Um, and next thing that I will show you is actually how to add these multi-modalities or audio images and video to the Argela dataset. And that's actually what we'll be doing with uh, data URLs. Uh, data URLs are a way to encode binary data into a string. So we will have this uh, B64 encoding to do that. And then later on, as you can see here, is that you can actually add each one of these data URL in, into your, your common well-known HTML. We have these kind of things for video, for audio, and for image as well. And these are three yeah, functions that are defined in order to load a file path, then load the data from that path, actually create an encoding, get the file type from that path. So use Pathlib to do that and then eventually get the last part of the extension for the file. And then I'll be creating these uh, data URLs and we can do that for yeah, video, audio, and, and images. Then what we will do again is yeah, create this feedback data set with a text field once again with uh, markdown equals true. And then uh, a text question to, for example, describe or to start working with like maybe creating a question answering data set for these images or video or these kind of things, which might be useful for fine tuning LLMs. So once again, we've created this data set. I added to this repository, which I'll share afterwards. I added some example data for PNG, MP3s, some snapshots from MP4 files, and I'll be loading those, as you can see, and be adding them as, as records. I think our request server is not allowing for large requests, but then eventually what we end up with is this overview of like content where we have this audio in the, the data set and we can actually describe. So hello, and then go to the next one and to the previous one where we have a similar experience. And it was the way to yeah showcase how, how we might add this uh, audio and images to our feedback data set records. And we also have this uh, overview to use the same approach with audio classification and with uh, image classification data sets directly from the hub. And yeah, I will, I will share the notebook and you can play around with that to, to yeah, showcase how that might work. Yeah, so for the, like the errors, but locally it, it worked fine. And of course, there's always the demo fantasy. But to get back to the questions, are we planning on integrating with providers of annotation labor like Upwork? I'm not entirely familiar with, with the offer that Upwork has, but we do plan on partnering with annotation providers and we already have some partners that actually work on that. But we do value like annotation providers that actually provide annotators that get paid well and have decent working environments and are yeah, in that sense more ethically correct than some of the things that we've been seeing from like these large producers that sometimes have, have laborers with lesser environments, work environments. Any further info about multimodal annotation? These things that I showed and the code that I'll share after are actually more of more hacks to allow for some basic support for image and text, for image and audio and video classification. And as you can also see on the roadmap, we don't have any direct overview or planning to, to include full multimodal support for annotation. But these are things that you can actually do to approach that. On top of that, what you can also do, for example, for video and these kind of things, actually add iframes to, to your HTML overview. But then, of course, they, the files need to be public instead of uploading them locally. We will be publishing some examples in the docs to, to show how to leverage these kind of basic capabilities for multimodal content and the different options. 
I think there are no more questions, right? No, are there any more questions? And otherwise, feel feel encouraged to actually provide some feedback on the, the session. You can find the URL here. And also, if you intend to attend, follow sessions, what you can actually do is send an email or some uh, Slack message or any type of communication that you can find us on to provide some requests for things that you want to see the following sessions and also to provide some feedback as to uh, how we can smoothen the, the process for you guys. Okay, cool. Then, uh, yeah, thanks everyone. It's thanks. been great questions and really happy to see you all and see you in two weeks. Bye. Bye-bye.